I was the last one to talk to him before he died. I was the first one to see him in heaven. Who would have thought that a convicted felon would get such an amazing privilege? Allow me to introduce myself to you this morning. My mother called me Dismas, but history remembers me as the good thief. And you might almost say that's an oxymoron because how in the world do you call a thief good? But I fancied myself to be a good man. I wasn't an ordinary thief. You would almost look at me as Robin Hood, stealing from the oppressor so that I can give to the poor. But your Bible refers to me as a criminal, one who rebels against authority. And that's what I was. I was a rebel, a revolutionary, a patriot with a good cause. And while others, like your disciple Matthew, sold out to the Romans and be and collected taxes from our own people, I fought to liberate our people. I believed the prophets of the Old Testament who had prophesied that the kingdom was to be for the Jews. And I was willing to shed my blood to make that happen. When I was a boy in synagogues, I was taught about a place called paradise, a place where righteous Jews went after death. What's more righteous than dying a martyr for your country? And here you are, you read your scriptures and you call me a criminal, and yet you esteem your own patriots like Patrick Henry, Henry who said, give me liberty or give me death. And that's exactly what our gang did. We called ourselves zealots. Our fingers itched to tear down the hated banners of Rome. Terrorism was our game, but we weren't like the cowards of your day, detonating mobs and killing innocent citizens. Romans called us, the, us the Sakurai, the Daggermen, the Sakari. And we would find Romans and Jewish traitors, and we would look them straight in the eye, and we would cut them to their bones. Yeah, we stole from our victims. Yeah, it takes cash to ta start a revolution. We especially relished robbing Jewish, rich Jewish men and collabor who collaborated with the enemy simply so that they could live a comfortable lifestyle while the rest of God's people were under oppression. There were all kinds of gangs in those days looking for a Messiah who would unite us. Some charismatic firebrand would rise up and excite us only to be, end up crucified on a Roman cross. And then we heard about this man named Jesus, that he was attracting thousands of thousands of people to him. We thought that he would be the one to deliver, but he wasn't doing it. Here's Jesus, instead of starting a revolution against Rome, he was healing the sick. He was caring for the poor. He was feeding multitudes. And he was talking about a kingdom that was different from what we dreamed. We had hoped we had found our Messiah, but when he began to speak about turning the other cheek and loving your enemy, that's not the stuff to revel inspire revolutionaries. And so my buddy and I hooked up with the notorious terrorist leader, Bar Barabbas, and the meanest SOB on this side of hell. And we had high hopes that Passover week. There were two million Jewish pilgrims that were coming back to Jerusalem. Revolution was in the air. The Romans were on terror alert. There were only 600 legionnaires at the fortress. And this was the time to strike. And we incited a mob to attack the fortress, but... The Romans were just too powerful for us. The carnage was horrific, and Bar Barabbas, my buddy, and I were captured alive. A military court was tried, and I was convicted and sentenced to death. And now here we are sitting in a dungeon cell, waiting to be nailed to the three crosses that were erected outside of the city of Jerusalem on a pile of rock called Golgotha, or the skull. And on the morning of our crucifixion, we heard the sounds of, of sandals running on the cobblestones above us. The air was filled with arguing and shouting. And later the guards came and they unchained our leader Barabbas and they dragged him out the door. 
And then there was this unearthly silence. Broken by the hissing of the crowd. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Surely they were yelling for Barabbas to die. And we can only sit here in the dark waiting our turn. And it wasn't long before the guards came and they took us. We've seen plenty of crucifixions in our lifetime. I knew what to expect. First they would take us in front of the crowds and flog us. And then they would parade us through the streets of the city all the way to where we were going to be crucified. My buddy was the first to be tied to that iron ring in the courtyard pillar. And two soldiers stood on either side of him, each of them holding a whip made of straps of leather, leather embedded with sharp stones, bits of broken glass and nails all over it. The whips were already bloody with blood and pieces of flesh. Someone had earlier felt the sting of the whip. We thought it was Barabbas. But I would hear later that what I thought was absolutely wrong. And after my friend was beaten to a bloody pulp and passed out, it was my turn. And the pain was excruciating beyond description. And then we were dragged out onto the streets. The glare of the sun was blinding to our eyes. Crowds were pushing against each other so simply so they could look, have a better look at us and mock us. And then they put a heavy beam on my shoulders and I had almost fainted from the pain of the wood that was pressing against my back. And then I saw him. It wasn't Barabbas, but it was the rabbi from Nazareth. The one who we had dismissed as a pacifist who would never do anything against Rome. He was battered. He was slashed. With a crown of thorns on his head and a cross beam across his bloodied shoulders, he was the one who had first tasted that whip. And I saw Barabbas out of the corner of my eye sneaking into the crowd as the crowds congratulated him on his good fortune that morning. And then I understood. Jesus was taking the place of Barabbas. I tried to make sense of all of this as I followed him, carrying my cross beam to the place of execution. I wondered if I was hallucinating, how could Jesus take Barabbas' place? And I can't describe the pain that I felt as those spikes were driven into my ankles and into my wrists, or the shame of being nailed there completely naked in front of this crowd. My muscles were paralyzed. I couldn't breathe. The cramping in my shoulders were unbearable. And yet, when I shifted the weight to my feet, the pain was excruciating. A splitting headache endured. The nerves of my limbs and my torso were screwed tighter and tighter. My tongue was swollen. The pain in my chest was suffocating. Every part of my body screamed, get me off of this cross. And the crowds below circled like sharks going for the kill, mocking Jesus. You could hear them, if you're the son of God, get off this cross. And I desperately hoped that he, had, he, would, that he would be the Messiah. So I joined in with my body and said, hey, listen, while you're at it, why don't you save us as well? But instead, I heard Jesus whisper, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I couldn't believe my ears, forgive them? How could he forgive the very people who are oppressing our people and now brutally killing us? And in anger, I joined my... Uh, friend by shouting the grossest of insults at Jesus. But then something happened. I can't explain it. The love that he had for those he were abusing touched me so deeply. I remembered the words of Isaiah that I learned as a child. I had recited about the Messiah as a little child that he was despised and rejected. A man of sorrow, surely he took our pain. He was pierced for our transgression. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. 
And then I understood. Jesus wasn't just taking the place of Barabbas, but he was taking the place of every son and every daughter of God. He was pierced for my sins. I remember the words of Isaiah 53 that he was numbered with the transgressors and my buddy and I were those transgressors on either side of him. And suddenly I was no longer the good thief or the patriot who killed for God and country. I was an idolater who turned to the political solution instead of God to solve my problems. I had to put my trust in false messiahs and charismatic political leaders I tried to build a utopia of my own imagination. It wasn't about God and country, but it was about me. And then I heard my partner in crime mocking him, and suddenly I was ashamed. And though my body shook with pain at every word, I cried out, Listen, don't you fear God? You and I deserve this punishment, but what has Jesus done? And I realized that he wasn't just a human Messiah, he was sinless. Indeed, he was the son of God that the great prophets of Israel had prophesied about. And then my blood cur curled old as I held him scream in agony, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I realized in that moment that he had been abandoned by the Heavenly Father so that I could be embraced into heaven. And to this day, I don't know what possessed me, but I blurted out with every breath that I had, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. All I knew at that moment was I was a sinner. He wasn't, and the only hope of salvation that I had was in the man that was on the cross next to me. As you Americans might say, it was sudden death overtime for me. I had no time left to do anything of my own way to get into paradise, but I knew that somehow whatever I needed in that moment, Jesus was accomplishing on the cross. His death was my only hope of eternal life. I was a desperate beggar reaching out a nail-pierced hand to a king wearing a crown of thorns in the hopes that a jailhouse confession and a dead breath conversion were enough. And to my surprise, Jesus looked at me and he said, Truly, today you will be with me in paradise. See, I knew what paradise was. I've learned about paradise growing up. It meant a beautiful garden, a garden that was so much better than what I was experiencing right now. And then I heard him cry out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He breathed his last and he slumped over. He had voluntarily given up his life. Quickly, quickly a legionnaire thrust a javelin into his side and blood and water gushed out from him. My Savior literally died of a crushed heart. And for a moment I panicked. Maybe he was just another false messiah who died on a Roman cross. And then the same legionnaire picked up a club and swung it, and I could feel the bones in my legs shatter to pieces. Fiery pain, fiery pain shot through my bones, and I couldn't stand up anymore. And as I slumped down, my internal organs began to collapse in on each other. I was suffocating to death, and I tried to remember what he said. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I tried to say that as well, but then came the darkness. And then suddenly, a blinding light obliterated my darkness. I was floating up and away from my body. I felt nothing in that moment, no pain. Instead, a sense of utter freedom, the liberation I had sought for my entire life. I looked down at my broken body below, being pulled off those spikes. I no longer had eyes, but I saw more clearly than I've ever done before. No nerves, no tissues, no brain, but I felt intensely alive. And then I felt myself enveloped by another spirit, pulsating with life and light. It was Jesus embracing me and carrying me past stars and galaxies and universe into another dimension. You can only imagine what I cannot explain. And echoing through the timeless space were the words of the Apostle Paul, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 
Millions upon millions of angels flying on wings of fire. Millions and millions of more angels dancing in front of Jesus like celestial butterflies. Believers released from their earthly bodies, worshiping in white robes. I wish I had a thousand tongues to tell you what I saw that day, or that there would be words to describe the glories of the heavens, or, you could, or that you would be able, have minds to be able to grasp what it's like up there. But you can only... Imagine. And then I went with Jesus to that place where God the Father sits enthroned above all the other heavens. And through, though my bodiless spirit had no eyes, I could see him. No hands, but I could raise spiritual ones in worship. No mouth, but I sang with tongues of angels. And for three days, time stood still in paradise. And then Jesus left us. And along with the rest, rest of heaven, I rushed to the edges of paradise and watched as he went back into the vastness of space, into that garden tomb where his body had been entombed. There's no time in heaven, but on earth it was Sunday morning. And we watched from heaven as dawn broke over that Palestinian hill. The stone rolled away. A binding light came from the darkness of that tomb causing the Roman soldiers to cover up in fear. And then Jesus came out, his glorified body dazzling like a thousand suns. And immediately the angels were dispatched from heaven to go tell his discouraged disciples that Jesus has risen from the dead. You can only imagine the erupts of joy in heaven that day. Will you join the angels and saints in that celebration. But friends, the best is yet to come. When Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection from the dead, he walked through locked doors into their hiding place. He said to them, listen, don't hug me yet because I haven't ascended to my Father. What is the power and glory in a resurrected human being that cannot be grasped by mere mortals? You can only imagine what it felt like what it will be like when we rise from the dead. And friends, we will rise from our graves because Jesus did. Every one of us who belongs to Jesus will have our own Easter experience. Forty days later, Jesus ascended into heaven in his new glorified human body, reunited with his spirit. And the disciples watched him disappear in the clouds, and the angels came to them and said, Why do you glaze into the skies? Jesus will come again, just like he left. Your St. Paul told you that when you die, just as I died on that cross, your bodies will be buried, but your spirits will go like-minded already into heaven. But one day... The trumpets of heaven will wake up the entire world. The resurrected Jesus will appear in the clouds as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And the apostle said that all who have died will come out of that grave. He said that in the time that it takes for you to blink your eye, all of the molecules and participles and particles of your deadly bodies will be put together, back together again, and they will rise from millions and millions of graves. Their remains glorified as they come out of the ground and out of the sea to look just like the glorified body of Jesus. I can hardly wait to be reunited with my body, which in 2,000 years has been turned to dust. I don't know how it will happen, but I can only imagine. After that, those of us who are still alive will be instantly glorified, and we will rise to meet our Savior face to face. Can you imagine what a day like that will be? Can you imagine what it will be like to see our Savior face to face? This morning, if you are here and you don't know Jesus, I've come back through time to speak to you this Resurrection Sunday morning. You still have time. Let an old thief who will grab a hold of Jesus at the last possible moment, tell you that Jesus is ready to save you for eternity right now. 
I can tell you from my experience, you never know when it's too late. But as long as you still have breath in your bodies, it's never too late. Please don't wait. Please don't wait. As long as you have breath, turn to Jesus. Come to him. Experience him. Enjoy him. Treasure him.